talking now. Hey guys, this is Prashant Kumar. I am the owner of My Realty Gains um, and I am in Long Island, New York. Uh, today we have uh, you know, distinguished guest, Rob Beardsley, and I'm gonna introduce him in a minute. Um, but just a little bit about ourselves, you know, we are, uh, you know, basically multifamily uh, acquisition syndication company, like probably what Rob does, similar kind of uh, domain. And, you know, I've been out there for approximately, you know, five years in, into multifamily. I personally own about 100 doors for myself. But in addition to that, you know, we were, able to participate into about 1200 units in the GP KP capacity in projects with our few of our partners, like deep level of um, partnership. We have not, we have bought few assets and we have sold them smaller assets, you know, 40, 50 units, but now we are ready to embark our journey into bigger projects. Uh, I have been a realtor in past, but I don't do that anymore. Along with me, I have vast network of investors and I, I know a bunch of people in the industry, uh, you know, all over the country, like every, all of you. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm into a growing mode, uh, like to connect with people. And uh, as of right now, I'm underwriting a few deals in Midwest and uh, probably would like to connect with some of you on, on that. But stay tuned for that. Uh, I'm going to shift gears now from myself to Rob. I know Rob for last maybe two years, but I met him personally about a year ago in city in one of the events. And uh, I'm very impressed with the, the way he does his underwriting. And that's an area, all area of interest for most of us, right? And, uh, you know, so basically I asked him, you know, why don't you come over uh, into our webinars and, and he graciously, graciously accepted that. Uh, just a little bit about uh, Rob, you know, he oversees acquisitions and capital markets for uh, Lone Star Capital and has acquired, Lone Star has acquired approximately $100 million worth of multifamily real estate in the last couple of years. Um, Rob personally has, has evaluated thousands of opportunities using his proprietary underwriting models and published um, number one book in multifamily underwriting. And that book is available on Amazon. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you know the name of that book. And he has written, I mean, he always writes good articles. You know, he's written about 50 articles on underwriting, deal structure and capital market, and he hosts the Capital Spotlight podcast, which is focused on interviewing institutional investors. So this webinar is sort of a unique chance to know more about the general underwriting best practices, learn about conservative underwriting strategies, and, and to understand how these practices can help, help us in uncertain markets or uncertain times what we are going through. Having said that, Rob, welcome, welcome to, for this webinar. And I'm sure this webinar would be very fruitful for everybody. So, so you, all, all to you, Rob, now. All right. <clears throat> Appreciate the introduction. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you well. I think everybody else can hear you well also. If not, so one more thing, just one more logistics. Uh, you have Q&A box. You can type your questions in Q&A box. And during this webinar, Rob has agreed that, you know, he will take questions during the webinar and we'll try to get deeper into, uh, deeper into underwriting practices that he's following so that the webinar actually is, is fruitful for all of us. Um, so, Rob, you can uh, share the screen now. I mean, you have the ability to share the screen. Um. Okay, sounds good. And like Prashant said, we've got a, a great opportunity to hopefully go a little bit deeper. Uh, you know, it's a big topic in terms of underwriting valuation and, and especially in the current economic uh, times we're in. So, 
rather than spend too much time on the basics, just let's quickly go over the basics so we're all on the same page. And then since we have a small enough group, let's be interactive and, you know, dive into specific topics and uh, questions that you may have. So to start, I'm going to share my screen on a, just an example underwriting that I used for a webinar a few weeks ago. And, you know, don't take these numbers too literally just because they've been manipulated and, and changed for presentation purposes. Um, but we will refer throughout the webinar to these numbers and we can potentially, uh, you know, make certain stress tests or changes and, and, and kind of play out those effects through a hypothetical deal. So to start out, I just want to go over the high level underwriting components and, and what is underwriting. And so hopefully everybody's on really knows what underwriting is, but if you don't know, underwriting is really the process of evaluating a deal from a financial perspective and it involves using some sort of financial model. It could be in Excel, it could be in Google Sheets, it could be Argus, just whatever you're using is fine. And uh, you know, here today we're using the under, underwriting model that, that my company uses uh, that I created from scratch um, over many iterations and something that I'm very comfortable with. And I will emphasize whatever you're using, you have to be comfortable with it. It doesn't, it's less important about the tool and more important about you and your uh, ability to use it. So, um, you know, with, with that, just let's cover the uh, main points of the underwriting and what's most important. So really looking at the, the big pieces is the unit mix. And so most of us here are value add investors and we're seeking to create higher returns through either opportunistic or, you know, renovation business plans. And so a big piece of that is what rents can I get on my renovated units? And that has a big um, effect on the outcome of your result of your deal. So just changing pro forma rents by $25 up or down could make your deal look amazing, could make your deal look horrible. And so you really want to make sure you get those right. So that's a big component of, of underwriting, which is the Unimix and the pro forma rents. And that ties into the revenue side of the um, income and expense equation. So on the revenue side, this unit mix flows to our gross potential rent here. So all this is, for example, using the stabilized is we're just summing up the different units with the pro forma rents to get to a gross potential rent. And so that's gross potential rent is assuming we had every unit full at the market rent, we would be collecting uh, you know, that full balance. But obviously we all know that never happens. There's many different types of losses. Obviously the big one is vacancy loss. We also have loss to lease, uh, concessions, non-revenue units, bad debt. And so we take into account these here um, and we have other income. And then going through expenses, pretty standard expense line items. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on just the, the nitty gritty if you really want a step-by-step -step walkthrough of, of literally every single input on this underwriting model, I highly recommend you go to Amazon and buy my book. Sorry to shamelessly self-plug, but it's, it's, it is really important and a pretty easy first step to go a long way towards your underwriting success. And, and trust me, it is, it is the money well spent, you know, so don't, I mean, whatever you spend is going to be worth, worth. Right. Hopefully you get a big ROI. Yeah. Um, and, and also if you, if you don't have this model already, you want to follow along or you want to tinker with it, um, your, yourself after the webinar, head over to lonestarcapgroup.com and you'll see a banner at the top to pop your email in and, and get this model sent over to you along with some other, um, bonus materials. So feel free to explore that as well. Um, and you know, let me know your thoughts. So big piece of underwriting is we're making assumptions, right? Pretty much throughout this whole, uh, process we're making assumptions and we live and die by our assumptions and so starting here the big assumptions are I'll just jump all the way to here which is the stabilization timeline so here I have it called stabilization months but what this means is you, you may have a, a plan to renovate 100 units and you're going to raise rents you're going to let's say you're buying a property that's 85 percent occupied and your plan is to bring it to 95 percent right? That doesn't happen overnight. And so you need to have some idea as to how long that's going to take. And this is actually a, a really important input, especially today with what we're dealing with, with COVID 
and something that I'd like to talk about more because a lot of people have been asking us, how do you underwrite? How have you changed your underwriting today in the midst of COVID? And I don't think anybody has the one right answer, but one thing's for sure is we're really lengthening out our stabilization time because of the current uncertainties. And a lot of investors that we're talking with and working with, they don't really want to hear that we're buying a property today and we're going to raise rents $150 because they think you're going to do that right now with, with all the economic uncertainties with the pandemic and all that. So, so investors, uh, you know, they're also pushing for a longer stabilization time or, or essentially just taking a pause, right? You may find a good asset to buy and there may real, really be a defensible value add plan to raise rents a hundred, two hundred dollars $200, but it just is, is more conservative to take a pause. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that is, you'll be surprised to see how much of an influence on your returns stabilization timeline has. So another big one is, are these annual escalators. So we have annual rent increase, annual expense increase, and property tax increase. So some other models opt for a more uh, detailed approach where every single line item has, is assigned a certain growth metric, and you can even assign a different growth uh, percentage for a given year. For me, I like to keep it as simple as possible. My goal is to have as few inputs as possible to still get the most accurate results. So, you know, most bang for my buck for, for, for each input. So for us, um, uh, we, we focus on, we, we actually truly don't focus on these that much because we like to keep these at 2%, 2% and 3%. And that's just what works for us in the markets we're in. Depending on what market you're in, property tax increase can be uh, very, you know, market by market. Um, but, but one thing that we feel very strongly about is to not really engineer returns through rent growth. We want the deal to be able to stack on its own without using three, four, five, six percent rent growth. I, I, I was on a call earlier today with a manager who confidently said, yeah, we've been throughout our portfolio, we've been experiencing what is it, eight and a half percent rent growth year over year. And that's not totally organic. It's including her value add. Uh, but still she's, she, you know, she wants to put that into the assumptions and that's just, that's just not the way that we want to look at deals. And um, we feel a lot more comfortable evaluating a deal with just essentially inflation with your expenses and your rents growing the same. Um, but as you saw, I was 3% earlier because this deal in particular that this is loosely based on was in Austin. Austin is a big growth market and you kind of have to, part of underwriting is you have to play the game. Yes, we want to underwrite conservatively and we want to beat up the rents, we want to beat up the exit cap rate, beat up the rent growth, but then the reality is we would never buy anything. So it's this delicate dance of how do we be aggressive enough that a deal looks good? Because if I, if I underwrote really pessimistically, I would never win any bid. So, so it's, it's this dance of how, how do I get aggressive enough to really be in the ballpark for the price expectation, yet not get myself into trouble and overpay, over leverage, and potentially, you know, have an outcome of, of, you know, losing money or not seeing the returns that you, you really are looking for. So, so this is, these are sensitive inputs, like I said, and then lastly, we'll jump to the terminal cap rate. So terminal cap rate, if you're not familiar, it's just really the way that you are valuing your sales price. And since most deals are again, value add, you're really making the majority of your return out of the sale. If you were buying something and you're, let's say your business plan was to hold it for 10 years and you're going to generate 80% of your returns out of cash flow, then your exit cap rate doesn't really matter. Because you made all your returns over 10 years through the cash flows and you're not really relying on any capital event. So um, that is a big indicator of the risk of the deal. And um, you know, we, look, we look at that closely meaning specifically how much of the returns are generated from cash flow versus appreciation. Um, and so that's something that actually I just wrote an article about that's going to be going out in my newsletter next week about kind of uh, factoring in risk into your underwriting, which I think is something that's not as much talked about, but really important because especially for the uneducated investor, kind of the more casual investor, they'll look at a deal that's 12% IRR projected and 16% IRR projected, and they'll just automatically go for the 16, assuming that that's the superior deal. And, you know, so, so in that article, I made, made efforts to show examples of where the 12 is actually far superior than the 16. 
And I think it's a, it's a really valuable skill to be able to actually figure that out. <clears throat> so and that's one way, judging how much of the return is based on cash flow versus appreciation. And then that determines how important the terminal cap rate is. And the, the thing that's pesky about the terminal cap rate is, especially if you're not really familiar with what it's doing or what it means, if I tell you, yeah, this deal has a five and three quarters exit cap rate here, and then I, I say, well, it really should be 6%. That didn't really mean much to you, and it doesn't seem like a big difference. But if you look, for example, we'll just show this example. At five and three quarters, our sales price is 16.27 million. And then if I just tick the ex exit cap rate to six, we went from 16 down to 15 and a half. So 16 point, I think it was 27 down to 15.6. So that's, you know, the exit cap rate moved a little bit and we lost a lot of value there. So it just shows you that, you know, don't get tricked by kind of these, these small numbers. They, they have a big impact. Similarly with, you know, your pro forma rents, if you change them by 10, 15, $25, it's going to have a big impact, especially with the compounding effects. So for example, if my pro forma rents are going to be a thousand dollars, but then I, let's say I push them up to a thousand twenty-five, and then I continue to grow that thousand twenty-five by three percent year over year, and then in year five I value that income of the thousand twenty-five rents that were then grown over five years compounded at a certain cap rate. I've just compounded my error, right? If if I were just underwriting in a in a one point in time that thousand versus thousand twenty-five dollar rent maybe isn't a huge deal, but because I then grew those rents by 3% compounded and then valued the exit sales price based on the, you know, that assumption, that's where uh, you know, you've compounded your error. So, so, that's, so we've walked through, it's, it's really all that simple. It's all the assumptions are contained with just in this tab. So everything you see here, it, you know, maybe if it's your first time looking at it, it looks messy and it looks like a lot, but it is really those key things that you need to worry about and you know, everything else is not super important. So just as I showed you how sensitive the terminal cap rate is to your exit price and then to your resulting returns, if I do something else, like for example, this deal right now currently has a nearly 15% return to investors. And I'll just show you how, let's say your CapEx budget, let's say you underestimated your budget and instead of 240,000, it's double, it's actually 480,000. Your return goes from 14.8 to only 14. So you can see that is not a sensitive input. That is not something that you should be spending all your time focusing on to make sure that you get perfectly right. I mean, yes, once you're under contract, you should do your due diligence and you should build out a capital budget, but understand that missing your exterior budget, for example, by, you know, you, you thought it was 240 it's, and it's actually double, doesn't kill your deal, but missing your exit cap rate by 25 or 50 basis points or your projected rents by $25 absolutely can kill your deal. So that's an example that I love to show because it really illustrates uh, that fact. So, so I want to take a pause there. I know that I've been seeing a lot of uh, messages come into the chat and let's see if we have any questions. Uh, so yeah, at this point I want to stop and kind of guide the conversation, maybe take some questions. And if, if there's nothing really uh, pressing on the question side, then we'll talk about underwriting today and what are kind of the key metrics, um, that we're looking at to make sure that we feel comfortable buying a deal in these uncertain times. Okay, so I see James is mentioning the COVID reserve requirements from agency lenders such as nine to 12 months of P&I um, and it kills the deal. So this is a great question because it's super topical and it's, and it's what we're all dealing with right now. So, so agency financing from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are really w w one of the few uh, positives and, and shining lights in the current very challenging uh, capital markets environment, right? Bridge lenders have been taken out of the game largely or they're, they've increased their prices substantially, pulled back proceeds. Life insurance has, wi you know, has widened their pricing. CMBS is you know, very challenged. The agencies have been doing very well, but to protect themselves, they've been asking for these really big reserves. Uh, and so the way that this works, I will um, actually show you hypothetically what this could look like. So here I have interest reserve 
on the model. Hopefully everybody can see that. And so to model out, so let's just say here, for example, I'm getting a 75% loan to cost loan, and we'll assume it's just a Fannie Mae loan, about $10 million. However, they're going to want, let's just say on the rough side, they're going to want 12 months of PNI. So I'll just go to year 10 because it's not even involved in my five-year hold period. And I'll pull, I'll, um, you know, match this to the debt service, which is PNI in year 10 to my interest reserve. So now what I'm underwriting is $519,000 being held back by the lender as an interest reserve. And what I'll do is I will go back to year two and I can rename this capital expenditures to COVID reserve refund, right? And I can go to year two and I can actually refund this like this. So if I want to be, you could say aggressive, I'll just say, well, in, sometime in year two, the full reserve is going to be released. I didn't touch it during the first 12 months and, and that's how that happens. And then what you'll see is it kind of creates a lumpy cash flow event and, and you see 21% cash on cash in year two. That's not obviously exactly right. It's a return of capital because it's coming as, as funded debt. But um, this is kind of the simplest and easiest way that we've solved for this issue and how we've been underwriting these holdback requirements. So to take it a step further now, to get more creative and to, you know, so, so, the, so because the next issue that comes up is now, guess what? I have to raise over half a million dollars more to get this deal done. And that's what's really killing deals and killing sponsors, right? Sponsor, you're already seeing senior lenders pull back the proceeds and then they have these requirements, these reserve requirements. And now if I'm a sponsor and I wanna do a 10, $13 million deal, I have to raise $5 million where before I could maybe raise two, $3 million. So, so that's a challenge. So one way to combat that is instead of simply having that reserve escrowed and then refunded to you in year two, what we can do is we can, and it, this fits perfectly with the idea of lengthening out your stabilization timeline and pausing. So for example, in this environment, we would rarely really underwrite to a nine month stabilization period, right? Depending on what the business plan is. And, and what I'll do here is let's just assume that I'm just gonna switch up the business plan and assume that we're doing an interior renovation on a hundred units, okay? So that's 500,000. And what I'll do is I will extend our stabilization timeline to 18 months, right? Because it's COVID, it's uncertain. Our investors don't want us spending money on CapEx and we don't know if we're gonna get an ROI at this point. So what we'll do also is I'll offset my capital budget by this amount. So I'll go like this. And so now it looks like my exterior budget's negative, but all I'm doing is I'm offsetting the reserve. And so it's getting a little confusing, but what we're essentially doing here is we're taking our interest reserve that we're going to be refunded after 12 months, assuming all is well with the property. And instead of just returning that back to investors, I'm simply just going to zero this out. And now it's not going to be returned to investors. It's going to be invested into the property to carry out the value add plan. And now what we've done is we've reduced our uh, equity requirement essentially by the reserve amount. And I've smoothed out my cash flows for modeling purposes. So as you can see, this is how we deal with the COVID reserves with agency lending. It's this interest reserve here that then gets refunded, but instead of refunded and returned back to investors, we then use it to carry out the business plan. So that's a great question, um, something that's very topical. But the initial requirement to raise that 500,000 still stands, right? Say that again. My, my question here is, Rob, that initial, the initial requirement, initial raise is still that 500,000 needs to be raised in addition to our original raise? Well, no, because if you are going to have that held back and then refunded and then returned back to investors, that was just an extra 500,000 that you really didn't need to raise. So instead, if you're using it towards CapEx, you're just, rather than raising the CapEx right. budget up front, you're just essentially getting it from the lender 12 months down the road. Um, and that's, shown here by this, uh, you know, this negative in our exterior right. budget. I mean, there's other ways you could show it in the model, but just conceptually speaking, um, that's the way around it. 
Got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. So uh, let's see if any other questions come in. That, that was a really good one. So if not, I will just dive into the kind of more high level business plan that we're looking for today and then how we're underwriting for that and, and um, adjusting our underwriting. We already talked about the stabilization timeline, talked about the COVID reserves. Um, so also just generally speaking, what kind of business plans we're looking for. So what we've seen is the value add deals that have low in place NOI have been a big challenge, um, especially deals that don't qualify for agency debt. As I mentioned before, if you're seeking any type of debt today for multifamily that is not agency, the pricing is, is expensive, more expensive than pre-COVID, and the proceeds are not as favorable. So a loan, a loan that you could have gotten pre-COVID that was 15 million, today you might only be getting 12 or 13 million. So it's, it's really affecting deals negatively. So, so for us, we're seeing you know, value add, opportunistic, you know, deep value add deals that require bridge loan are, are very difficult to do today, almost impossible to transact on because sellers are still holding on to their price. Meanwhile, your financing has gotten worse and obviously you've probably gotten more conservative on your assumptions, uh, just given what's happening today. Uh, even if you think everything's gonna go back to normal, you're still probably going to underwrite a longer stabilization timeline. Um, and investors generally are less willing to pursue uh, rent increases and lenders are as well. If, if, if you are doing a bridge loan and your, your plan is a value add, a lender would much rather see you buy a deal that's maybe 80% occupied that you're going to lease up to 95 rather than a property that's already 95% occupied or, or 90 and your plan is to push rents and compete with newer product and, and really push the top of the, of the rental market. Uh, just because that's a less believable thesis today than really just bringing a property to market rather than pushing market. So there's just a lot more hesitation around that today. So what we're looking for is we're looking for deals that underwrite well in a longer term hold period, because as I keep talking about the uncertainties of today, I still think 10 years from now, multifamily is going to be a, a lot better than what it is today in terms of rents, in terms of um, you know, essentially NOIs, valuations, et cetera. So our long-term view doesn't change at all. And we just need to be able to buy deals that are going to weather the storm that may come or may not, who knows, we've been waiting for it and it hasn't come yet. Uh, it needs to be able to weather the storm and get to the other side and then continue to do well and make us money on the other side of that. So really that uh, pushes you towards deals that are maybe a bit newer, uh, in better locations. So you're taking less infrastructure risk, right? Because if you're buying a deal and you plan to hold it for 10 years, ideally, you know, you don't, you don't buy something that is for sure going to have plumbing issues, roof issues, electrical, uh, all that kind of stuff. So a newer property, if you can get it is obviously superior for a longer term hold and a better location where there's more growth makes a lot of sense as well, right? It doesn't make sense to own a deal long term if you're not going to benefit from the, ongoing market growth in in the area so it's really it's fine to buy deals and you know call it tertiary markets or markets that are kind of slow and steady um if you can val if you can create value right because otherwise the market isn't really creating value for you and then your only other real avenue to, to create good performance is just to buy cheap enough so that your cap rate is high enough so that you can just cash flow like crazy and not even and not, not really care about the growth or your exit. Um, but as we all know today, prices are high and you know such that it's very difficult to really do that. So taking a pause here, please explain how you select your exit cap rate. So that's a great question. Exit cap rate is much more of an art than a science. And it's really all about knowing your market, knowing your deals, and uh, you know, the only way to do that is through practice and, and repetitions. And this is one of the reasons, um, there are much bigger reasons, but just one of the reasons why I preach, I think it's important to specialize in one market, especially when you're getting started. 
Um, because if you can talk to the brokers on a daily basis and underwrite, you know, 10, 20 deals a week in that market, you'll really get to, to see what cap rates are in your view. So cap rate is such a subjective term. Uh, it, it's, it's a very simple definition, NOI divided by purchase price. But from there, there's all this nuance. And so, so for us, we have a very particular cap rate formula that we focus on, and it's right here. And as you can see, I mean, it's a little simpler than what this formula looks. We're just taking the in-place revenue. So essentially, what is the T12 or the seller's revenue? And then we subtract it by our pro forma expenses. Because again, if we're buying from a mom and pop operator that let's say has, you know, $50,000 of payroll instead of kind of that full normal payroll on a professionally managed property, that's going to inflate his cap rate. As you can see, I just took the seller's cap rate to a seven, but he's not selling me a seven cap because market rate expenses, which are going to be largely my expenses, make it a six cap. So, so you need to not just hear cap rates and take them at face value. You need to develop your own way of evaluating cap rates, getting comfortable with them and really grooving that. <clears throat> so that way, because CoStar, right, if you, if you get CoStar data or Yardi data or you get information from your broker and they tell you, oh, this deal's a six cap or I just sold that deal down the street and it's a five and a half cap, that means nothing to you because you have no idea really what those numbers are. So you really do have to underwrite the deal and then start seeing what your cap rate is and then comparing it. And then once you know, generally speaking, what cap rates are, you can then project your exit cap rates. And so that's really the, the magic and the important part. The easy part that you're going to hear that's kind of the standard definition that everybody uses for how to calculate exit cap rate is that's like, oh, I'll just take whatever cap rate I'm buying at and then I'll increase it by 10 basis points per year or I'll just increase it by 50 basis points. So if I'm buying a, let's just say here, I'm buying a 6% cap rate and what, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll buy the six cap and I'll increase it by, you know, 50 bips and I'm selling it at six and a half. Um, so, and that works pretty well, but a couple problems with that. So the biggest problem is if you're buying a value add deal. So for example, let's actually just show you in real time. So let's say this deal to make it really simple. Let's just say this deal had high vacancy, right? So it has 22.8% vacancy. So now my cap rate is 3.85 that I'm buying at. And so the conventional wisdom is telling you, okay, well, you're buying at a 3.85, add on 50 basis points, and you're selling at a 4.35. But you are horrendously overstating your sales price with this low cap rate, right? If we look at the sales price now, 20 million, right? It just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, even if you don't really know the market or the deal, that just doesn't make sense, right? So we can't really base our exit cap rate on our going in cap rate because our going in cap rate could be uh, impacted by, again, a value add plan where there's high vacancy or low rents driving a lower NOI. And so you're buying at a compressed cap rate in the hopes of adding value through your renovation plan and your management plan to then bring you to a higher cap rate. And then your sales cap rate is just, it's just another number in that mix. So they're not always connected. But what is important is you need to understand what would be the cap rate if you were to sell the deal that you're trying to sell. What I mean by that is if today you're buying a value add deal, but you're stabilizing the asset, improving the asset, and then you're going to sell it as just a, a yield play, as a cash flow asset, what would be the cap rate for that today? Um, because otherwise you're comparing apples to oranges. So that's the important piece. And, and one way to do that is just to underwrite many deals and to actually underwrite deals that aren't value added and see, okay, you know, bid on them, even if you don't really want to buy them and just see where those end up selling for. And then you can see what cap rate they ended up selling for. And that'll help inform your exit cap rate. So that's, that's an, definitely more of an art than a science and takes a long time to really groove it. Next question is what pro forma assumptions have you modified in light of the pandemic situation? Okay, great. So, so the key assumptions that we've changed really to keep it simple, because we've had, we, you know, we've underwritten, you know, how many deals, I don't know, a hundred or 200 deals, uh, you know, in the last six months. And we don't want to, let's say they didn't trade and then they come back to us 
off market or something and we have a chance to bid on them again. We don't want to just throw away the old underwriting, re-underwrite it completely due to COVID. We just want to really pick those key metrics that we can modify um, you know, to, to, to give that result. So what we decided to do is we decided to change our stabilization timeline, as I mentioned before, for the, for the reasons of you may not want to start your value add right after you buy. You might want to wait until, you know, as everybody's saying, the dust settles and then you can com complete your value add. <clears throat> um, and, there's, and there's other difficulties going on right now too. For example, you can't evict and that's just going to slow your uh, ability to turn the rent roll and, and cause your value add. So stabilization timeline is a big one and we're, 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 we're increasing it anywhere from six to 12 months more than from what we were doing pre COVID. And I think honestly, that's even a bit aggressive. Um, let's just show an example. So let's just bring our exit cap rate more normal and we'll show you. So this deal is now, well, to make it make more sense. Um, I've just been changing a lot of numbers here. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a real example of how this affects the numbers. Let's just take this 14.4% project return. And if I, let's just say, bring my stabilization back down to 12, it was 14.4, now it's 16.1. So there's your difference there. And if you take it up to 24, you know, taking that weight, it you know, continues to hurt your deal. So that, that has a big impact. And it's one way to really bring down your returns um, without even doing too much, right? So the next, Thing that we have been adjusting is our going in vacancy rate. So we're just assuming that there's going to be in the short term, right? Again, we're still very bullish on multifamily in the long term. We believe in the deals and the markets that we're investing in. Um, but in the short term, there might be collection issues, right? Bad debt. Eventually, when you can't evict, you're going to have a lot of evictions and eviction costs and, and just people that can't or are not willing to pay right now. So we stress our going in vacancy. So even if we see a deal that's currently at 95% vacancy, we just assume that there is or are going to be problems. And so we might, instead of, even though it's 95, we might go in at 90%, for example. So that's one great way to kind of better reflect the potential risks um, today without going overboard. And for example, saying, oh, I think the world's coming to an end. And instead of stabilizing the vacancy on this deal to six, I'm gonna stabilize to 10, right? Because that will just completely crush your deal and as you can see, we're in a single digits IRR and it's, it's just not going to make sense. So, and then the last one that we're stressing often is the hold period. And I mentioned this before, you know, we're biased towards longer hold periods today rather than shorter hold periods because just the short term is more uncertain, right? The deals that return the best and, 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 and do the best are the, are the shorter term holds. But that's usually because you're benefited by a growing market, um, and you're able to sell, you might've bought a deal that was a value add, renovated 20 of 20% 20 of the units, and then you're selling it again as a value add. And so someone's going to pay a four or four and a half cap to you because they think there's still meat on the bone. And so that's just when people are getting their 25s and 30 IRRs over an 18 to 36 month hold period. Um, but we think that's a very challenging business plan to underwrite to today. So, you know, really at a minimum we're underwriting things to a five-year hold period, often a seven-year hold period, maybe even a 10-year hold period if we think we really like the deal as a, you know, it's a good market, good quality asset, longer term play. Uh, but just generally speaking, let's just see, I mean, every deal is different in how it responds to returns. But if I bring down the stabilization timeline and I'm showing a 13.4% return over a three-year hold period, if I go to five, actually this deal has rent growth, so it's probably gonna get better but we typically don't show rent growth. And that's, that's an interesting piece there uh, that I should call out because there I got you know, kind of tricked into the longer hold period thinking that it was going to reduce my returns, but it actually increased because it gave it more time for the numbers to grow because I was assuming rent growth. So, so be very careful because everything's interconnected. So if you're going to underwrite a deal on a 10 year hold, we will never do 3% rent growth over a 10 year hold because it's very rare that you could point to a point in history and say, here, here was a, a point in time that 10 consecutive years of positive rent growth, 3% or more, uh, you know, that's nearly impossible to find and, and not very likely. 
So the longer your hold period, the more conservative you want to get on your rent growth. But if you're going to do a three year or five year hold period, you can, you know, potentially increase your uh, rent growth. So let's take a look. What else do we have? So yeah, that, that, those were the three just to wrap up on the uh, pandemic situation, modified underwriting. We've got stabilization timeline, going in vacancy rate, and the whole period. <clears throat> what markets are you most bullish about long term? I'm not really a market research kind of, uh, kind of person. We're, we're very much a uh, bottom up shop where we're really looking at a deal first and then you know, going up to the market, up to the sub market, then the market. Uh, so we're really deal driven rather than market driven. Uh, but markets bullish about long term. I think Vegas, I'm very interested to see how Vegas crashes if it does. So far, we, we, we own an asset in Vegas and it's performed well. And it seems like, generally speaking, Vegas has performed well, which is very surprising. It's experienced negative 20% job growth. Um, so you would think that would result in some, some pain there. So in the short term, not bullish there, but long term, I think it'll rebound well. And then I think your classic growth markets are going to continue to do well. And I think uh, there's some people that are on both sides of the migration fence. But for example, you know, the more affordable uh, markets that you have a lot of people migrating to, kind of like your, your Phoenix, your Dallas, your Denver's, uh, some people have pointed to data that shows that during recessions, people don't move as much. And that's going to stifle the migration and the growth to those markets because those markets are fueled by population growth which then fuels, you know, which, which is driven by the job growth and et cetera. So some people are saying, well, a recession is actually going to stifle migration and then stifle those migration markets. Again, you know, uh, Phoenix, Denver, Dallas, Atlanta. Um, but I'm kind of thinking more, I'm more of the opposite, which is the group that just thinks, hey, in a recession, people want affordability. They want quality of life. With the pandemic, they want more space. So they're going to be continuing to leave New York City, continuing to leave Los Angeles, going to those more affordable dynamic markets that present more opportunity. So I think bullish long term hasn't really changed. Uh, so again, it's kind of those name brand markets that I have mentioned a few times now. Unfortunately, the pricing there is absolutely nuts. And, and to really make a deal pencil there, you've got to push and squeeze every single number and be very aggressive. So there's really no free lunch. I, I can tell you the best markets, I can tell you the best deals, but you're going to have to pay for them. So that's a, uh, that's a big challenge. Um, physical or economic vacancy. So because this is a spreadsheet, you know, we're dealing with economic vacancy. Uh, and depending on how you define that, we just are quantifying vacancy with numbers because we're working with numbers, but also some people refer to economic vacancy as kind of the total economic loss, which would encompass your loss to lease, vacancy loss, concessions, non-revenue, and bad debt. And, and non-revenue units are, you know, let's say you're using a unit as a maintenance shed. Let's say you're using a unit to store something or your, uh, a non-revenue unit could be a free unit to one of your employees. Um, so that would be your total economic loss. So, uh, whereas physical vacancy would simply just be based on the rent roll heads and beds calculation. So are you considering decompression of cap rates due to COVID? So decompression of cap rates. So, so cap rates increasing going up, which would mean putting downward pressure on values. Um, no. So it's been very interesting to see what's been going on with, the market today and it's fascinating how much demand there is and how much capital there is. So for example, brokers are telling me, yeah, on, on deals where we normally would get 70 confidentiality agreements signed in the first week, or I'm not sure exactly what he said, which first of all, that's, that's pretty crazy. 70 people looking at a deal that scares me. He says today they just launched a deal. 200 CAs were signed, right? So, what that's telling you is there's less to look at, but there's still the same number of eyeballs. So that's going to keep prices up because less sellers are willing to sell right now just because they don't think it's a good time to sell, which I tend to agree, but that's just leaving buyers starved for product. And with, even if we have a recession and even if there's distress, right, everybody's talking about this opportunity of 
you know, deals underperforming and let's say, you know, a, a sponsor's in trouble, they lack cash flow, maybe their lenders on them. And, you know, there's going to be deals that are distressed and you can buy for cheap. But the problem is for every distressed deal that may look like that, that needs work, that is underperforming, it's mismanaged, there's going to be 10 buyers and that's really going to keep prices high. So, so you, in the end, what needs to happen in order for there really to be a true buying opportunity is the supply of mismanaged and, and you know, deals going for sale needs to outweigh the demand from the buy side. There needs to be just a, a delusional supply that overwhelms all these buyers and there's not enough buyers to take on all these, you know, value add opportunistic mismanaged deals. So I really struggle to see that happening and that's what's going to keep cap rates compressed. Also, I know, Prashant, do you want to jump in? I see you. Yeah, I, I meant to, uh, sorry, I mean, I'll let you finish it, then I'll, I'll say something. Okay, so yeah, just to finish the thought, another thing that's really anchoring cap rates low is uh, interest rates. So, you know, the 10-year treasury bond has uh, fallen and, uh, you know, all in financing is 3% or less for, eight, for, for multifamily. And, you know, typically the average spread between cap rates and interest rates is somewhere between, you know, somewhere around, I'd say 150 to 300 basis points. So right now we're in this healthy, very healthy band in terms of valuation. You'll see when things get very, when, when prices get too crazy and, and unhealthy is when cap rates equal interest rates, um, which is very much so, off, it's often the case in primary markets. So you, you, you will see that in you know, LA, DC, Boston, New York. So the gateway markets, you will see cap rates equal interest rates, which is in a very unfortunate reality because then you're not getting any positive leverage from your financing. And so essentially if you're buying a four cap and your interest rate on your debt is four, your cash flow is going to also be four. Uh, but if you have a situation today where your cap rate is five, which is low, but your debt is three and you have interest only, your cash flow is going to be eight, nine percent depending on your, your fees and expenses. So uh, that positive leverage is important and that's kind of keeping the market healthy right now. Go ahead. No, so I mean, I kind of agree with what you are, what you are saying about uh, a lot of people looking at the deal. I mean, more number of people looking at the deal um, than number of deals uh, at this moment. But at the same time, I feel that you know a lot of sellers are not ready to put their deals on the market. That's one thing. Second, I feel that there are a lot more people looking at the deals, but not everybody is ready to buy them ready to pick them up also. I mean, I, I think a lot of people are sitting at home and you know they're sort of idle. So they are starting to call brokers. And so, I mean, we have heard that in last three, four months, broker phones have been ringing like constantly because everybody wants, wanted to utilize their time and establish contacts with brokers. So, so broker now sending one deal to 50 people. Now they are sending deal to 200 people that's another phenomena that we are seeing. Uh, and, and that's just my observation. Obviously, you are better positioned in the market to kind of, uh, you know, see that at a different scale. But, um, you know, I, I've seen that uh, the sellers are not there to sell. I mean, they, they are kind of holding their uh, bets, um, you know, like, you know, like you, they also think that, you know, maybe the market will correct a little bit, but it will eventually go, go back up. Um, so they haven't opened up the inventory and number of buyers are more because everybody wants to look at, everybody wants to take a jump start in their business. You know, they may be thinking of buying in January 2021, but right now, I mean, I personally, I'm talking to at least five, 10 brokers, which I never do. I try to do a one or two calls a day to brokers. Right now I'm talking five to 10. Uh, and, and I guess a lot of people are doing that. And that, that probably is the reason why, you know, that distinguishing, you know, 70 CAs to 200 CAs, but, but trust me, not, not everybody out of those 200, not everybody is there to buy. I mean, they're like, I mean, half of them are flying kites. I mean, in my mind. Gotcha. Yeah. And you know, another thing that I'm hearing a lot and I'm, I'm reading articles about is that institutional investors, just given the way their investment committees are set up and their mandates, they are much more hesitant to buy, put out offers, et cetera, right? They have a much easier time, especially with committed capital to just go pencils down. 
Um, so, you know, I've seen those articles that say, hey, this is the time for the little guy to shine because you've got all these institutional buyers that are pencils down. Uh, but I, we're not seeing that, right? We're seeing, like you said, the CA numbers through the roof and, you know, so I think even with that, maybe, like you said, they're not as qualified of buyers, which, which may be true, um, but it does still seem like there's a, a big supply there, a uh, big demand of buyers. So, so basic, basic question I think everybody would have in their mind right now, what is, the, what is coming, right? Everybody is kind of thinking about that. What is coming? What is next? I mean, is it, I mean, are they going to get, um, you know, better deals three, six months down the line? So that's, I think that's the fundamental question, you know, why, why everybody kind of waiting in a waiting mode or those who are doing what they're doing, like you guys are buying uh, aggressively. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, I mean, I know you, you said that, yes, it is going to go up, but do you see any indication anywhere where you might, we might see a, uh, you know, sort of a dip a little bit? And, and we see that in CoStar reports. So all of the CoStar reports, you know, you pick up their curves are, they're going down a little bit and then they're coming back up, right? I mean, you must have seen it. Um, so what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so, so I'm optimistic slightly that we do see over the next six months some decline in, in pricing um, and at least more interesting opportunities, right? Because we've just been seeing for the last few years just hundreds of deals that are just kind of your vanilla value add that really have already been picked clean and, and there's really not that much meat on the bone. So hopefully there's, you know, some of these poorly managed properties get shaken loose and actually do come to market. And so even if the discount is only 5% or 10%, uh, that's still going to you know, get people excited and, and, and allow us to transact, right? Because right now there's a lot of reasons for their just to, for the bid ask gap to, to be so wide and not be able to transact. So hopefully we, in over the next six months, we get into a position of a much more transactable market. Um, and so that's what I'm optimistic about. I think it's gonna be very interesting to see what the government stimulus looks like uh, that's coming, if it does come, how it looks, how it impacts multifamily, um, and to see that if the current performance of multifamily has been driven by the stimulus itself, right? Are people paying rent because they're collecting unemployment or, or are they paying rent because you know, we have a healthy job market in spite of COVID? So it's, it's, it's going to be very telling if things don't get extended uh, to see how, how we perform. So I think that's really what everybody's looking for and um, will allow us to make future decisions. Uh, really quickly before we, I just wanna go back real quick. I have a question here about putting rent growth assumptions on the value at increases or only on the market rents. So everybody does this differently, right? Everybody has their own way of underwriting, their own way of looking at the deal. So the way that we look at it is a little more conservative. Uh, so, so what we do is that stabilization timeline that I talked about so much is the time that we take to go from those market rents that I had in the model. I'll quickly share my screen again. So our market rents here, we're going, essentially what we're saying is we're gonna take this 12 month stabilization timeline to go from these market rents to these pro forma rents. No rent growth, no changes there. Once we've stabilized after the 12 months, then we're going to begin growing at this 2% mark. So actually, for example, if let's say I just kept these rents flat with the market, um, you know, no value add plan, and I held my stabilization timeline to 12 months, that would mean I'm actually factoring in 0% rent growth for the first 12 months. And so a lot of people are doing that uh, today just with the uncertainties of the market. They're saying, well, we're not going to raise rents for the first 12 months or what have you. And so that's one way that we're actually underwriting, you know, no rent growth is, you know, it still shows 2% rent growth here, but it doesn't start until after the stabilization. Yes, yeah, so there is one more question here. Um, um, if you can, do you want me to read it? Or? I, I see it. So it's about uh, telling brokers passing on a deal about COVID restrictions. So I'm not sure what that exactly means. It could be about the ability to tour or to do due diligence, which is another challenge today. You know, how do you, if you have a 250 unit property, how do you walk inside of everyone's home, right? 250 homes to inspect it. Uh, so, so lenders have to get flexible with this, buyers have to get flexible with this. And so we're seeing many creative deal structures, 
and uh, to, to be able to come in and do your due diligence. Uh, but it looks like the question's actually about the numbers don't work. Well, we're in the business of telling brokers that the numbers are crazy. So we do that every day, all day. It doesn't matter if it's due to COVID or due to the seller being crazy, the broker's crazy, the market's crazy. Everyone's crazy but us. And that's what we have to say every day. Very good. Very good. Any more questions, guys? Feel free to ask any questions. I mean, in, in the meantime, yeah, I would like to share one thing here. You know, I've been talking to a lot of mom and pop sellers. What I have seen is even though some of the sellers have been uh, you know, holding their bets till now. And, and I feel like some of them are opening up as we speak, you know, like in the last couple of weeks, I'm seeing a lot more inventory coming uh, at a smaller scale, you know, 50 to 100 units and sort of portfolio, you know, 30 units here, 30 units there, that kind of uh, deals in the market. And what I have seen is sellers are so smart. They want to package the whole thing and they want to say, they are saying that, you know, on their actual expense, this is a seven cap deal. And they are willing to give 80% uh, 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 you know, seller financing at 6% uh, interest. You know, the, the, those kind of deals are popping up. Uh, you know, it's just becoming, you know, I've not seen those, maybe, maybe I haven't looked it in enough, but I'm suddenly seeing those kind of deals in last uh, one month or so, where seller packages their portfolio and they, they do the cap rate on the actual, which is minimal, um, kind of shows, you know, to your example, it's a higher cap rate deal. And at the same time, they are willing to give it, give the seller financing also so that they, they get the highest price, but for the next two years, they keep getting the interest also on their money. So that's something which I wanted to share, you know, th those kind of deals are popping up here and there, you know, uh, mostly in, in Midwest, you know, Ohio, uh, in, in those areas, you know. So uh, that, that just a shift in, in the seller's mindset that I'm observing. All right, so there's a question for you uh, there, uh, Rob. Yeah, I don't fully understand the question, but I think it has to do with markets that are, are hit now, but still trending well. Uh, if that's if that's the case, then I think Vegas is a good example of of a market like that. Orlando is a is a market. Orlando, very interesting situation with Orlando. It was obviously one of the market darlings pre COVID. You know, a lot of investor demand, tons of rent growth, uh, everything you want in a market. And the agencies obviously love the market. They're lending at eighty percent of purchase price, <clears throat> and then now. Orlando is on Fannie Mae's pre-review list. So Orlando goes from, you know, a great market, <clears throat> agencies love to finance it, and now it's on its pre-review list, along with, you know, um, Midland, Odessa, Houston, um, you know, everywhere in Michigan, you know, Detroit, for example. So, so now you go from 80% leverage in Orlando to 70, 65 even. So you're, you know, I actually got a deal quoted pre-COVID for a loan at 14 million, and today it's coming in at 11 million. So that's hitting Orlando's value very hard. And so I think Orlando could potentially be a very interesting market to buy into if we see prices go down. Very nice. Half, half of the investors here on this call are gonna start talking to Orlando brokers tomorrow. Yeah, they probably are already. I <laughs> oh, no, good, good. Um, Yes, I mean, we are, we are right about time right now. Uh, we talked for an hour. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of open we, and I'm sure Rob, you are too. Um, if there are any more questions, we should take them. Uh, you know, guys, feel free to ask any questions. You know, I don't have any more, any questions from my side. But um, uh, let's see, give a minute or so. Uh, yeah, looks like, you know, we are kind of drawing down on, yeah, we are drawing down on questions. Rob, you know, I think uh, maybe, maybe we'll call you again after a couple of months, you know, to talk about uh, the state of the market, you know, <laughs> probably, you know, six months down the line uh, to, to, to hear your thoughts. But this was very informative. 
uh, very, very informative. Um, and we really appreciate you taking time. I mean, you are in California. We are here, uh, you know, doing this in our, you know, spare time, nine o'clock in the night. And, but thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate your time. And, you know, uh, wish you luck for your deals that you are working on and hope, uh, you know, you get some traction out of this for you too. And uh, that's great. Great. Again, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I had a great time. And if anybody wants to connect further, again, you can check us out, LoneStarCapGroup.com. If you have any questions, email me directly, Rob at LoneStarCapGroup.com. Yeah, one, and one more thing, you know, I, I think a lot of people have not caught my email ID, Prashant at MyRealtyGains.com. You know, you see my, my logo, you know, behind me. MyRealtyGains.com or MultifamilyRealtyGains.com. They're two email IDs I have. 